are recording. Does anyone see the recording button? Yes, sweet. Okay, so hi to everybody at home. We have our little intrepid band of IP lawyers here for week four of IP law. And uh, this week we will be looking at trademarks. Uh, so without further ado, I will start the screen sharing. And I'll share my main screen. And I will get my little document up here. So can everybody see the document? Uh, it, I'll go up the top here. Uh, so it should say workshop for trademarks, week four workshop trademarks. Yeah, sweet. Okay. Uh, so um, I think this week we'll just launch in without too much further ado because um, we have been running over a little bit um, in our past couple of uh, workshops and I know that people have to uh, run off, some people have to run off to, um, to property so we'll keep it short and sweet if we can this week. <coughs> um, so we have a trademark problem to look at this week. Uh, we know Nigel and Roy by now very, very well We've had a look at their copyright problems with Mary. We've had a little look at their uh, patent and confidential uh, problems. And uh, now we need to look at what issues may be involved in this little set of facts in relation to trademarks. Firstly, we see that they chose the name Hungry Max. Okay, that's fine. They came up with that name. Uh, and they obviously have registered it as a business name and they are now operating under the name Hungry Max. Mary was the one who designed the logo, which was the, the cheeky smile person who was winking. And she also came up with the slogan, Hungry Max, 11 secret herbs and spices make our burgers cool for chewing. Uh, and they open, they realise that they're going to need a trademark and so they file an application for a trademark that was accepted for registration and published in the Gazette. They then received these nasty letters, cease and desist letters from McDonald's, Hungry Jack's and, oh, not KFC because KFC decide not to say anything. Uh, the McDonald's letter concludes with, your business has no prospects of legally succeeding, blah, 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 scary stuff, scary stuff. And the Hungry Jack's letter uh, concludes with, your business is flagrantly attempting to write off Hungry Jack's reputation with burger, burgers since 1971. Okay. They are the salient facts for us tonight so far as trademarks go. And the first thing we want to do is look at the objections that Mary could make to Nigel and Roy's trademark application. Okay, so this, this first question will involve just a little bit of revision of our copyright uh, knowledge so that we can then launch forth into our trademark knowledge. So this is one of the great things about IP law is that um, so many of the IP rights uh, run over the top of and intersect with uh, the other IP rights. So firstly, before we can get to answer any of the trademark stuff, let's wind it back and say, what did she do for Nigel and Roy? She did two things. Now, let me just have a little look at the chat box in case somebody's chatting to me. So Mary designed the logo and the menus. Yes. Uh, menus. And also the, what? The slogan. Yes. Right. Okay, I don't think we have to worry about the menus here. 
So for our purposes, the two things that we're interested in is uh, logo and slogan. Firstly, in relation to the logo, what, what did we decide when we were looking at, at copyright uh, would be the case? Would Mary's logo uh, get protection under copyright? What do you need to show? I think we decided that it would be covered because it was something of her own creation. Yeah. Okay, is that the test? Okay. Give me a second, I'll go back in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> It, it needs to be an original work. Okay. Original work of... Now, sorry, that, I'm not screaming at you here. <laughs> okay, so what does that mean, an original work of, of authorship? What kind of work would the logo be? What are the types of things that are protected by copyright law? It would be an artwork, wouldn't it, surely? Yes. Yes, exactly. An artistic. An artistic, yeah. Yeah. So you've got artistic, musical, dramatical and literal. Dramatic works. They're the categories that you can have. Artistic work. Okay. So what, are the, what is bound up in the notion of originality? It needs to be novel. It needs to have a novel char char characteristic to it. It needs to be new. Can't have been thought of before. Can't have been made before. Ah, that's patent law. Um, so what we need to work out is originality so far as copyright is concerned, is bound up with two things. One, you have to be the author, and two, uh, it can't be copied. And that's the fairly low threshold that you have in terms of originality, so far as copyright is concerned. We did see that um, uh, after that series of, of cases that started off with, uh, you know, the phone book cases and morphed into the ICE TV case, that uh, there's likely to be some requirement of creativity, at least where it comes to compilations, but that's not going to worry us. So it's likely that she gets copyright protection. Okay, so we know that we have this person out there that's trying to cause trouble and she probably owns uh, copyright in the logo. What about the slogan? Uh, that wouldn't come under copyright because it's uh, slogans usually don't because of the All right. If Let's unpack it. If you were going to try and argue for protection of it, what, what would you try and say that it was? A literary, musical, artistic or a dramatic work? Uh, literary. Yeah, yeah. So, and that would be the literary work that you're trying to argue as having copyright protection here. Okay, so, I don't know why these are all going everywhere, but oh, there we go. Okay, what was the case, can you remember the case that looked at uh, headings of newspaper articles? And one was, uh, <laughs> I love this one. Oh, the Whit Sunday's case? Yeah. And somewhere in the Whit Sundays. Yeah, that was uh, Sullivan and F and H. Okay, 
Now, that said, probably not protectable there. Well, in fact, it did. It said not protectable. Not sufficiently uh, uh, substantive to be a literary work. Yes? It just taught, it just used words in ordinary parlance. And there was that also that other one, uh, the help help um, drive in danger called zero zero zero. Remember that one as well. So possibly not. Although I am open to contrary arguments on that. Um, I don't think it matters too much because if they are just looking for a trademark in the words Hungry Max, let's unpack that. Would it be if, let's say a worst case scenario, Mary had copyright protection in uh, Hungry Max, 11 Secret Herbs and Spices, make our burgers cool for chewing, lol. What do you, in order to constitute copyright infringement, what do you have to take? What do you have to do? You have to use a substantial part of it. Yes. And what do you think about Hungry Max as opposed to the rest of all of that slogan? But it starts with Big Max, doesn't it? Uh, hungry, the, the slogan that we're looking at here. In mine, it says Big Max, 11 secret herbs and spices. Yeah, the name of the business is Hungry Max. The, sl the slogan is Big Max. Oh, I, apologies then. That is incorrect. It should be Hungry Max. But even if it was Big Max, um, I guess mm, Big Max 11. In terms of the copyright analysis, I don't think it's going to, to make it, uh, a big difference. Because even if it said Big Max 11 secret herbs and spices make our burgers cool for chewing, are you taking, whether you say it's Hungry Jacks or Big Macs, do those two words constitute a substantial reproduction? Are they taking a substantial part? No, not really. I think, I, I don't think they, they would be. And the reasons, if you want to have a look at the case law, there is a, a case where uh, Exxon, you know, the big US oil company, petroleum and oil company, tried to um, turn to copyright protection for the word Exxon. Now, you would think that that would certainly um, have sufficient creativity because it's not an ordinary English word. But the court was very keen in that case to avoid any problems with copyright wandering into what it considered to be trademark territory. And it was not substantial enough to be a literary work and therefore get copyright protection. So I don't think it would make any difference whether it was Hungry Max or Big Max. The fact is, if Mary had come up with that slogan, I don't think just use of the first two words would be a substantial reproduction and therefore copyright infringement. Okay. So what, what do we think that Nigel and Roy are actually applying for? Yeah. Let me copy this. What are they applying for? We now know Mary's position in terms of um, copyright. Well, I'm not sure why my numbers have gone all crazy here. Hmm, three. <laughs> I'm just going to not number this. 
they it, from the what what I'm reading, it says they're trying to copyright their business name. They filed an application for a trademark for their name. Yes, business name. So, just this. So, is Mary's copyright, if any, probably in the logo, possibly in the slogan, although probably not, is that going to pose an issue for them? Um, from how I would see it from the one I'm, the one we're reading off, the students where their the slogan is Big Macs, mm -hmm. I would say probably not because... Uh, she doesn't own the copyright to. She doesn't own the copyright for the business name. Yeah. And where she would try to be relying is would probably be Section Fifty Eight uh, of the Tra Trademarks Act, saying that she is the owner of the that trademark, or potentially uh, Sixty Two Alpha, where an application made in bad faith, if she still considered that her she was the owner of that you know trademark. Wow, that is 10 gold stars for that one. Um, however, there is a slight problem. Um, where you are looking at this kind of issue where there could be uh, a, a potential copyright owner out there in the wings wanting to oppose your application, um, I'll just shoot over to, to the legislation so that um, everybody can see what I'm talking about. Uh, so, Jack has said possibly Mary could argue that, where are we, uh, 58, the applicant is not the owner. That makes kind of sense, doesn't it, when you just read the legislation. However, the problem is that the owner of the mark so far as trademark law is concerned, is the first user. Okay. Now, if Mary has not applied the mark that Nigel and Roy are applying for in the course of trade and commerce and used it first as an owner of a trademark, then she can't complain under Section 58. And it doesn't seem like Mary has used that herself, does it? So the spot we look at is Section 42. So if she could have copyright protection for Hungry Max or Big Max, uh, then for Nigel and Roy to use that would be copyright infringement and therefore contrary to law. Okay, so that's that's where we go there. Um, like I said, though, <laughs> that's um, awesome in terms of thinking of Section 58. That's certainly thinking laterally. And, uh, you know, just reading that off its own, you would think, wouldn't you, that it would apply. But it, it actually... The, the correct section we would use would be 42. Okay, so it looks like Mary's not going to be a problem. So just one question. Where would um, 62A, where it's application made in bad faith, then fall in? I and mean, when would that be used? If uh -huh. not yes. Let me just flip to it so that everyone can see what you're talking about. There we go. Bad faith is an awesome um, concept um, and it's usually made where your applicant is very clearly trying to um, write off the coattails of somebody else. And there there has been an explosion of the literature on registration in bad faith and 
a lot of that discussion actually revolves around the problems that we are encountering with Chinese, uh, the Chinese registration of Western trademarks. And there was a massive, massive dispute between Michael Jordan and um, uh, a Chinese sporting goods uh, retailer uh, over the use of Michael Jordan's name. Um, they nicked his name. <laughs> and uh, uh, that was clearly done in, in bad faith. Uh, however, interestingly, uh, they had also registered the, the name in, um, what's the name for the literal translation of uh, English into Chinese? Transliteration. Uh, transliteration, yeah. They were allowed to use the Chinese transliteration of Michael Jordan. Uh, they were allowed to keep using that. Um, but there's been a massive amount of registrations in China uh, just basically flagrantly ripping uh, other people's marks off and trying to get them into China as, as that whole middle class in China rises and people are starting to look at branding and all of the, uh, you know, the lu particularly luxury brands and the, um, the, the cachet that goes along with Western marks uh, there's been just this explosion on the Chinese registration um, uh, system of people just nicking other people's trademarks. So that's your classic example of, of bad faith. I'm sure there's plenty of other ones. Now, on this point, what I will say, if you do have a question that, that comes to you at 2 a.m. <laughs> and you, you have to find the answer to it, um, I was just talking about this with a student um, today, actually, by email. And if you haven't already gone there, I really would suggest that you have a look at the patents, trademarks and related rights um, commentary, which is on the Lexis Advanced Pacific database in the library. It is extraordinarily detailed. Uh, and it gives you everything you could almost ever want uh, in terms of patents, trademarks. Uh, I think it's also passing off as well is, is in there. And it's super duper useful when you are uh, researching, for example, in your 50% your assignment or your 40% assignment uh, because if you hop into, so you can go in, you can search it. I'll just wait, my internet's a bit slow. Uh, but you can look at your detailed explanation of any particular part of the legislation and then it gives you links to the cases that it talks about, which is, you know, it really cuts your research time down significantly. Okay, so tip to the wise. Uh, if you want to drill down and find answers to that kind of stuff, that's where you'll find them. Okay, so whether or not uh, there was copyright protection is not going to be too much of a problem. So you're looking at sections, section 42, contrary to law, is uh, the section Mary would use if she could establish. So, AJ, could Mary argue on the grounds of first use? I'm just trying to decipher my scribbling, and I've got uh, the owner of an unregistered trademark in Australia for particular goods or services taken to be the first person to use it in Australia on the course of their trade of those goods. Could yeah. Could argue on those grounds? Yeah, that's what I said to you before. So, um, Jack's point about Section 58, I'll just go back here, uh, Section 58. Um, so Jack said, oh, could she, could she, could Mary say that she was the, the owner of the mark? Uh, because she didn't use the mark in trade or commerce on our facts as, uh, as a trademark, that is a mark, a sign that distinguishes 
uh, one trader's goods or services from another, go down to the defini definition here, signed used to distinguish goods or services in the course of trade uh, by a person, uh, we'll just get this out of the way. So by, essentially because she didn't charge them or she wasn't running her own business with that, she can't go back on that clause? No, it's not because she didn't charge them. It's because she didn't use it in the course of trade first. Okay, got it. Thank you. And, and it has to be um, use as a trademark. So she would have had to actually use the trademark first and then she could be said to be the owner. Yeah? So that's where we get to that little uh, resolution there. So on that, on that note, AJ, like if, if she was just for some reason able to argue that she, was, uh, she had used it in trade or commerce, wouldn't Nigel and Roy then be able to use the bad faith because she made it for them? She made it for their business. That was what it, that was the purpose of its, its existence. So if she can actually argue that she did use it for trade or commerce, then she's just trademarking it in bad faith because it wasn't purposed for her. It was purposed for Nigel and Roy. But if she was contracted, if you, you got to go back to your copyright, if she was um, commissioned by them, which she wasn't. It was just a friend, mm. right? So there was no contractual relationship there. Even if she was commissioned, uh, she would still own the copyright. Okay. But if, yeah, so, but if, she's, yes, but if she was trying it, to trademark it. Uh -huh. the, the intent was for her to, for it to be used by Nigel and Roy, but she's not doing anything wrong in terms of trademark law because she owns the copyright. I think you would have bad faith is really quite, um, it's quite a serious allegation. I just think you would have a little bit of trouble pushing that one home. Prove me wrong though. Have a little paddle about in uh, that commentary that I was talking to you about and see if you can prove me wrong. See if you can come up with an argument for me. <laughs> I think that you probably have difficulty. That's my initial off the cuff reaction there. Uh, okay, so look, I don't think that she's gonna pose a, a problem there. So, we can kind of write her off as an issue. What are the chances of opposition by McDonald's or Hungry Jacks uh, succeeding against Nigel and Roy? Okay, so here I think we'll probably first do Hungry Jacks because that's probably going to stand the most um, chance of success, I think. Um, what did you think? Now, I appreciate it's I'm making you think on the fly a bit if your copy said Big Mac. and uh, But it did say that they were just, in your, um, in your copy, it did say that they were trying to register their name. Did it? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. So we're talking on the same terms then. So we all know that they're trying to register Hungry Macs. Okay, that's good. Um, what are the grounds of opposition? Well, in this case, I think the the, the ground for opposition for Hungry Jacks would be um, under Section 43 for causing confusion, I think. I mean, uh, whether they were, whether Nigel and Roy were intentionally trying to deceive, uh, possibly, but I think... Um, Overall, it, it would like the hungry Max and hungry Jacks that would cause confusion, especially given the fact that it's for the identical business. Basically, it's for selling burgers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you have skipped ahead a little. I will just take you back one second to establish for the folks at home uh, how you get here, and that is registration of a trademark. Well, this is section 57. Registration of a trademark may be opposed on any of the grounds on which an application for registration may be rejected by, that is rejected by an examiner under the Act. 
except for the graphical representation of objection. So if you have a look for uh, grounds of rejection, they are all contained in sections 39 to 44. So Oliver has, has had a little look at those various different grounds for rejecting an application and he said, Meh, maybe, you know what, maybe it could be likely to deceive or cause confusion. What did other people think? Uh, I thought it was more section 44 because it was deceptively similar. Okay. Uh, so that was Kate, wasn't it? Kate R. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, Yes, I think that there is uh, an argument under section 44. I am, I'm just pausing in relation to 43. Why am I pausing? So this is 44. And Kate is talking about this, the uh, provision, sub-provision number one, which is an application can be rejected or we know under 57 it can be opposed if the applicant's mark is substantially identical or deceptively similar to a trademark registered by another person in respect of similar goods or closely related services uh, and the priority date for that cited mark is earlier. So what Hungry Jacks would be saying is, well, hang on a minute, it's substantially identical or deceptively similar with our mark. We've got it registered and our, our registration has an earlier priority date. That is the basis of section 44. Why am I pausing in relation to 43? Because it seems to fit, doesn't it? Application for registration must be rejected or opposed if because of some common connotation that the trademark or sign contained in the trademark has, the use of the mark in relation to those goods or services would be likely to deceive or cause confusion. Why doesn't that apply? Is it, I sort of hazard a guess, is it, to in, is it for inducing, like intentionally inducing confusion or deception? No, it's really interesting. It, and this is trademark law to a T, folks. Because of some connotation that the mark or a sign contained in the mark has. So what Hungry Jacks, if Hungry Jacks was going to run a, a confusion argument, that confusion wouldn't be caused by something in Nigel and Roy's mark itself. It would be because that of the way, the effect that that mark would have when it's used in the marketplace alongside the likes of Hungry Jacks. Section 43 is quite limited to something in the mark itself that is misleading about its goods or services. Okay, so something in the mark, when it's used on the goods or services applied for, would cause deception or confusion. And this is where you have, uh, I think the text talks about the uh, primary healthcare services or primary medical services was the mark that was applied for. And uh, in fact, the applicant did not provide primary health care at all, okay? It actually just was a management company and an administration company that provided ad administrative and management services for primary health care providers, okay? And it was refused on 43 because it was basically said, well, you know, if you saw that mark, you would think that they were in the business of providing primary health care, and they're not. Yes? So uh, where, and I'm, but I'm very glad you brought that up, where you would go in terms of looking at what we would ordinarily call, you know, like a Section 18 of the ACL misleading or deceptive conduct kind of a scenario, if you were going to try and oppose on something like that, 
you would look again at section 42. And you would say, you've got, to, you've got to refuse it and the opposition has to succeed because it's going to be contrary to law. It just has to be a bit more convoluted because it would be contrary to law. Why is it contrary to law? Well, in this case, it's got nothing to do with copyright infringement. In this case, it would be a breach of Section 18 of the ACL. So that's how that bit works, okay? But uh, getting back to good old 44, I think 44, if you just quickly scan down the other possible grounds for opposing, um, it doesn't contain any of those listed signs. Uh, there's no problem with representing it graphically. Uh, it can distinguish Hungry Max. I mean, certainly Hungry Jack's got on, on the books, so I don't think there's an issue with not being inherently adapted to distinguish. Uh, it's not scandalous. You know, it's not like that FCUK uh, trademark registration. Uh, possible Section 43, but then we worked out, no, it's not. So the way that you would try and argue that deception would be under 42. Uh, the big one here I wanted you to look at, because this is probably the most technical ground of opposition that you can get, is the one about substantially identical or deceptively similar, okay, to an earlier mark. Now, let's unpack what we have so far. The three main questions in 44 are, is it substantially identical or deceptive? Specifically similar, uh, is the cited mark registered or being sought, or is registration being sought? And is the cited mark, oh, does the cited mark have an earlier priority date? Okay, well, who had a look? Did anyone have a look at whether Hungry Jacks is registered? Pardon me. Uh, Hungry Jacks is a registered trademark because it um it actually won its own trademark case against Burger King in two thousand one. Yeah, there's a there's a whole backstory there, isn't there? Uh, yes, the the mark is registered, and it is. I can even here give you the registration number. Um, it's kind of fun to go and start searching for this stuff um, if you have, you know, if you have two spare minutes. Uh, the trademark database um, is at, well, if you just type into Google trademark searching Australia, you'll come up with the, uh, the Atmos search here. Um, but it's definitely there. It's currently registered. Now, there is its priority date. So we know immediately there's a problem there because two of those hurdles we can see straight away have been cleared. The cited mark is registered and it's got an earlier priority date. So it all comes down, doesn't it, to whether or not Hungry Jacks or Hungry Max is substantially identical or deceptively similar to uh, Hungry Jacks. Okay. What is substantially identical for the purposes of trademark law? What do you have to do to work out if two marks are substantially identical? Is it the side-by-side -side comparison of the marks? Yes, absolutely. Well, what are you what are you looking for here? The similarities or differences between the two. Yes. Thank you, Tanya. It's not defined. So there's no nice little definition here. So it all comes down to case law. And the trusty, the trusty one that all of us pull out. First cab off the rank is the Shell case. 
you need to do a side-by-side -side comparison of the marks and compare the similarities and the differences. Okay, you've got to look at the essential features of the registered mark and the overall impression. Okay, overall, do you think it would be similar? Or overall, do you think that it's sufficiently different? Okay, now the substantially identical hurdle is quite high. Okay, and where there are you know, a number of differences, and you might think they, they're even fairly slight differences, you'll often get over that substantial identity test, okay? Even if you get over that test then, deceptive similarity, what's that? Let's work out our principles for comparison in terms of deceptive similarity. Um, isn't that the impression that's left by the mark? Yes! Yes, it's a broader, much broader excursion that is involved with deceptive similarity, okay? Um, it is defined in uh, the legislation in Section 10. And uh, here, yeah. it has to be likely to deceive or cause confusion. So nearly resemble the mark here. Let's flip over to. Let's flip over. I always like working with the legislation, especially trademarks act, because it's so little compared to uh, most of the other legislation that we're used to. If it so nearly resembles the other mark, it's likely to deceive or cause confusion. Okay. So that's deceptive similarity. Let's unpack that. The Australian Woolen Mills case is the case that we go to here. And before I, before we go into that, can anybody uh, enlighten me as to what the Australian Woolen Mills case says? Uh, it says whether um, it says it, it's not done by a side by side comparison. It's yes. more that based on the impression, based on regulation of the plaintiff's mark that the persons of ordinary intelligence would have. Yeah, that's right. We call that the doctrine of imperfect recollection in trademark law. So here, what you're saying is, hmm, if I think back to Hungry Jacks, and everybody knows what the Hungry Jacks uh, mark looks like, and here we're just looking at um, the words, aren't we? Uh, and that's all they're trying to register here is just the words. So you don't, where you're looking at opposition, you, do, you don't look at uh, any small or narrow view of the mark or what it's used on. You have to look at what the mark is being applied for. So it's just the words, no colours. And you have to look at that mark as used for the entire description that's in your class description. So where we had a little look at the Hungry Jack's mark, this is the class that it's in and this is the description that it's in. So you'd have to look at Nigel and Roy's mark, which would be Hungry Max, and you would have to say, what is the impression of that compared to just these words here? unadorned by any colours or anything like that. And you have to look at the entire thing that Nigel and Roy had written in here, uh, their class description, we call that. Okay. So looking at the two, hmm, issues of similar sounds might be important. Burly bra, knocked out barley bra on the basis of uh, similarities of sound. What do you think? I'd say, yeah, probably just sort of the, um, the, the cadence in which you sort of, you say it and read it in your head would sort of be the same as Hungry Jacks, Hungry Max, very similar sounds in the secondary word. Yeah. Sort of giving an impression. Yeah. The difficulty here, I think, Particularly is that um, as you as you picked up on Jack, um, 
there is case law out there that says that the first word in particular is quite important in a trademark and it tends to be the thing that sticks in people's minds. So the immediate problem for here for Nigel and Roy is that um, the first word in both of these marks is exactly the same. So then they're going to have to come down to nice little arguments of, you know, uh, the, the soft M in Max is very uh, distinctive or is, is really sticking in your mind as compared to the harsh J sound in the Jack word and that, that the soft M would sufficiently stick in a, a consumer's mind so as to avoid deception. I think that would be an uphill battle making that argument particularly when you're thinking about what it says in terms of deceive or cause confusion. Remember uh, back to the, the case law that you would have had a look at for Section 18 of the ACL, uh, you have to look at the class of person that's going to be confused potentially. Uh, and we had a case like uh, Parkdale and Paksu, which was about uh, the use of a, a mark on furniture, um, well, the court was prepared to be a bit harsher because they said if you're going to spend out a number of thousands of dollars for a new lounge suite, you're going to really want to make sure that it's the right brand that you're after. However, where you have purchases that are made really quick, like fast food, you might be wandering in, you know, 11 o'clock at night, I mean, how often have you, I do this regularly, how often have you been into a deli and you just grab something out of the drinks cabinet and then you've wandered out of the shop and you've realised you picked up the wrong drink? So, fairly easily done. So, I think, look, it, it would very likely to me, I think, be confusing. So, I think there is a real probability that Hungry Jacks would knock it off. Does anyone have a contrary view? Okay, so I think they're Hungry Jacks. It's, it's probably uh, not going to be substantially identical, but it probably would be deceptively similar. And one case, if you want to have a look at deceptive uh, similarity here, that's a little bit like this, is the Dial and Angel case, and uh, that case involved babysitting. I don't know if you've ever used Dial and Angel, I have. Um, and they wanted to knock off Guardian Angel, and they got up. Okay, the use of <coughs> something that sticks in your mind, like Angel for ba babysitting, uh, was you know, even allowing for imperfect recollection, uh, something like guardian angel, yeah, it, there's a likelihood of confusion. Okay. Uh, now, we've already discussed section 42, and that is a, a breach of section 18 of the ACL. Now, we'll have a look more at that next week. And if you want to prepare a little bit for next week, I would probably suggest I took part of this um, uh, scenario from a case that I think is um, a bit disappointing, shall I say, uh, and it's Target and Catch of the Day. And uh, Catch of the Day, uh, the lady that... that started that, tried to register a mark Has anyone used the word Target when they're going to Target? Yeah. So the moment that Target saw that be accepted for registration, they're like, ah, we can't have that. Very interesting little case. Anyway, so Section 42 is where you would complain about that kind of misleading or deceptive uh, conduct confusion in the sense of Section 18 of the ACL. What about Maccas? I mean, we've got all our principles now. Uh, McDonald's, um, even if you have a look at their, their trademark on the um, 
in the trademark registration, they've actually they're in one of their endorsements of the trademark Big Mac is that registration of the trademark should give no right to the exclusive use of the surname Mac. Yes. Yes. And I hope that I can, <laughs> I hope I caused them sufficient grief. I, I got a mark through against Spruce and Ferguson in Sydney. I can't see just a pure word mark. Let's just let's search on a pure word mark. I just searched Big Mac. Oh, did you? You know, they lost that in Europe just recently. Uh, yeah, no, um, October, November last year. So a like I think it was Burger King decided to take the mick out of them by <laughs> saying um, like a Big Mac only grill, uh, flame grilled or something. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, okay, so endorsements. There you go. So they're the little limitations that you um, sometimes slip through, slip into your um, application uh, to get it across the, the line for an examiner that's concerned about your, your mark in some way. So what the examiner's saying is, hang on a minute, you can't stop other people from using this. And they've gone, okay, that's fine. What we do is we disclaim any monopoly in just that. Yep, to get it across the line for registration. So, interesting, hey. Uh, what do you think? Would it be substantially identical? We know we're going to have a side-by-side. -side. No, I don't think it would get substantially identical and probably not even perceptibly similar. No, I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, although that wouldn't stop McDonald's having a go. Because when, when I was trying to get uh, McBrat through, uh, they still had a go at us for that. So anything with MC, they'll have a go at. Uh, so expect to have a fight and expect them to use dirty tactics probably not a terribly strong argument, but they'll try and wear you out by making you spend enough money that you just have to give up. That's normally their tactic. Okay. But in, in law, I think you're right. Uh, in terms of mm, deceptive similarity, even Hungry Max as compared to McDonald's. Mm, no. Okay. That probably sums up the, uh, the law part of things. Uh, did anyone have any queries on that? No, all good. Commercial thinking. Let's put our, our commercial lawyering hats on. What would they do about Mary? What, what factors should they consider in formulating their response to her? Firstly, if they were only going to seek registration for the words Hungry Mac, how would they respond to her? If you were drafting up a letter of response, she has said to you, your clients, uh, we note that your trademark for um, Hungry Macs uh, has been accepted for registration. However, our client uh, will seek file an opposition to uh, your accepted trademark and believes that it would not proceed to registration. What would you say? Isn't it up to her to prove the reasons why, though? Wouldn't you be asking for what the reasons are? Normally, in in one of these responses, you just you come back strong. So you could you could ask them to maybe just cost the other side a bit more in legal fees. <laughs> it's all about strategy. Uh, you could ask them to enumerate specifically what they were going to oppose on. Sure, cost them a bit of extra money.
Now, if I if I did that, what what's the problem for the other side in that? You're going to be basically showing your hand to them, aren't you? And normally what you your client, if you're going to try and file an opposition, you don't want to get too bogged down in a whole heap of correspondence before you file. It's kind of a put up or shut up kind of situation. Uh, and you really, you don't want to give the other party too much of a heads up as to what the basis of your, uh, your opposition will be. So you're going to kind of force them into a situation of, if they're really not, if they don't know what they're doing, they might tell you. Um, otherwise, they might just go ahead and file if they didn't get a satisfactory response from you. What else do you think? You could just simply say, sorry, uh, we don't believe our client has considered the matter and uh, we don't believe you could succeed in opposition. Basically, two with the hills. If you're really serious, bring it on. We'll have a fight. And we've already worked out that we think she has a weak, weak position, so I wouldn't be worried about it. Um, if they were, however, seeking registration of the logo and the words, the slogan, what do they have to do? And this should roll off the, t the tip of your tongue because we discussed it before in the copyright workshop. Create a contract with them to get yeah. a license? Uh, yes. A license is probably a bronze star kind of a solution. What's the what's the gold star solution? I uh, get them her to actually give over the rights. So yes. What what do we call that? A signing. Yes. Yay. They need to get an assignment. So the main the main. Uh, <laughs> And you're going to get sick of me harping, harping on about this. But the main lesson to be learnt there would be? Use contracts and, put, and own the rights before it gets beyond to a fight. Exactly. IP, IP is much, much easier to deal with if you've tied up all of the ownership rights before you start business or certainly before you start filing anything. Yes? Cool, bananas. It's a nice little, uh, it's very technical trademark law, but it's, um, it's kind of fun. What do you think about trademark law? Did you kind of have fun with it or it's, it's all still a bit of a mishmash of legislative provisions at this point? I like it better than looking through the Copyright Act. <laughs> I know the trademark act is like this, and the copy the copyright legislation is just massive. I know stuff. Well, thanks to the guys at home. I'll stop the recording.